I wonder what kind of junk I've got in this box with bag of me. physical copy of Toonstruck that I totally have photoshopped in, in post. Oh well, let's, let's give it a shot, eh? I'm going to talk about Toonstruck for the next 19 minutes. In the 90s, point and click adventure games were all the rage, with the love and adoration of games such as Monkey Island, King's Quest and many others, there were certainly a lot of games to sift through. While nowadays you still hear people rave about the previously mentioned games, there are times where I find games nobody really speaks about anymore. My last video, Return to Zork, was just one of those games, but that was just a small taste of what was to come. While Return to Zork certainly had its fair share of relatively well-known actors, one game outshone that game with a large ensemble cast, Toonstruck, which featured many prominent actors, Ben Stein, Dan Castellaneta, Dom DeLuise, Tress McNeil, Jim Cunnings, and starring Christopher Lloyd as the main character, Drew Blank, a struggling cartoonist tasked with designing new characters for his TV show Fluffy Fluffy Bun Bun. However, having pulled an all-nighter, Drew finds himself transported into a television, trapped in a cartoon world consisting of the lands of Qtopia and the Malevolands, the latter of which is ruled by Count Nefarious, which seeks to turn everything evil using his Malevolator. In all honesty, of all things to be sucked into, this is pretty tame. Imagine he'd fallen asleep at Nero's computer when Deviant Art was open or something. Oh God, it's asleep! I can't lie. Oh, wake up, bro! Wake up! Damn it! Drew meets with his creation, Flux Wildly, who resides in the nearby lands of Zenidu, who takes him to see King Yu, who agrees to help the cartoonist back to his own world, as long as he helps create a weapon to combat the Malevolator. The Cutifier, leading us into the first act of Toonstruck. With the inclusion of Drew journeying through a cartoon world, I think the best comparison that could be made is to the 1988 movie who framed Roger Rabbit, which also mixed real-life acting with animation. And, you know, also features Christopher Lloyd. Remember me, Eddie? When I kill your brother, I talk just like that! Toonstruck operates using a flow of gameplay that could be considered similar to LucasArts adventure games such as Monkey Island and Sam and Max, eradicating the potential of dying in the game and falling into one of my most despised aspects of adventure gaming, pitfalls. Drew can interact with the environment and drop items into his bottomless bag, which can be used to help solve puzzles. As he travels along the lands, he is accompanied by his friend, Flux, who can be interacted with in a manner similar to how Sam interacts with Max in the Sam and Max series. In what is a pretty inviting example of good game design, Toonstruck opens with the duo confined to the castle, which originally consists of four screens. The main chamber, the trophy room, the engineer's room, and the Qtopian design room. Before leaving, Drew and Flux need to talk with the engineer bric a -brac, who helps explain the purpose of their mission, and provides them with the ability to store inventory items. This helps introduce the player to the concepts of talking to NPCs where Drew can use different icons to pursue conversation. 
The most consistent is an ice block, which acts as breaking the ice, and often leads to opening different topics of conversation, which are depicted with their own icons. As Drew exhausts conversations, they'll notice that the ice block will continue to break and melt until they've exhausted all conversation, and it's replaced with a puddle that cannot be clicked on. Eventually, after learning the concept and finding the engineer's glasses, the player is given their task and are able to head out into the world by collecting parts of the cutifier using the Malevolator blueprints as a basis. Now, the game makes it out as if the items for the cutifier are supposed to be the opposite of what the Malevolator used. However, that isn't accurate. Instead, the items need to be different, but of a similar nature and is more in line with well-known pairs than anything. Sugar pairs of spice, cloak pairs of dagger, spit pairs of polish, and so on. A lot of these operate using a think outside of the box aspect, where the player might need to improvise similar to how Guybrush Freakwood might substitute an item for something similar in the Monkey Island series, such as using a skull and crossbone pirate flag in place of a human skull. An example in Toonstruck is seen when trying to solve the polish element of the device. While spit and polish might relate to the act of spitting and wiping something to clean it, the game has you instead pair the polish with a roasting spit, acting as one of the vital ingredients to design the cutifier. It's a great touch, and really helps solidify the sense of substitution that makes puzzles and adventure games work. In order to find the parts needed, Drew needs to travel across the world searching for any items that may fit with the requirements. Logic and thinking are just some of the areas that a player needs to circumvent the obstacles of Toonstruck. Or I mean, failing that, the ability to read a guide or a hint website. As the player progresses, new dangers present themselves as Nefarious becomes aware of Drew's meddling and sends his henchmen to capture the duo. At certain moments, Nefarious' henchmen will show up, and if they find Drew in flux, they will lock them away in a jail cell in the Malevolence. Every time they appear, the player is treated to a cutscene of them appearing, giving the player ample time to hide away in a conveniently placed hiding space, avoiding capture. However, if the player is unfortunate to be locked away, they will need to partake in some tedious puzzles. To begin with, they need to escape from the jail cell. Since the jail is carpeted, Drew can build up static to shock the door. He has to do this several times to lower the years of sentence, thus opening the door. After this, the player needs to solve a sliding puzzle to receive their items back. And I hate sliding puzzles with a passion. Once they open it, they get their items back, and can also snag a black hole, which acts as a fast travel between areas. If the player desperately wants, they can solve the sliding puzzle without being caught to just get the black hole, but its purpose is pretty limited, and honestly doesn't feel particularly like a good method of fast travel, so I wouldn't particularly recommend it. I'd honestly say that the player is likely faster just right-clicking to automatically transition between areas. Many of the environments are also subject to change after completing certain areas. Some of the Qtopian lands will be attacked by the Malevolator, shaping the positive denizens of Qtopia into more... twisted... variants. Marge! Polly? Mistress Marge! And Punisher Polly! Divas of Destruction! Give it to me! <laughs> now, if you told me that I was going to play a 25 year old game with BDSM farm animals, I would not have believed you, but uh, well, here we are. A lot of the items gathered for the cutifier are pretty simplistic, but there was one that eluded me for so long. The criteria to match the stripes. My first thought was stars and stripes, but I couldn't find anything to use. So I did the unthinkable. I looked up a hint website. Normally when I do this and I see the answer, I usually feel that the logic falls flat, and I am irked. But boy, was I impressed with the solution. 
being set in a cartoon world, a lot of the puzzles operate using cartoon logic, so in order to receive some stars, you need to try knocking out a cartoon so they see stars. So <laughs> it's honestly such an obscure solution, but the logic is certainly there, even if it isn't logic from reality, but for cartoon standards. And that's a good thing based upon the cartoon setting of Toonstruck. Eventually, after placing all of the correct items, the cutifier is complete, but Drew finds that King Yu is not who he's cracked up to be, where it's instead revealed that he's actually Fluffy Bun Bun, intending only to allow the cartoonist to return home if he helps cutify the entire world. One that will give me the power to create all the happy things I desire. <laughs> In short, I will be a god. <laughs> when he refuses, she demands that they are captured, but not before Nefarious's henchmen snatch Drew and Flux is cutified to go out and change all the world into a sappy good after school special. The second part of Toonstruck takes place in Nefarious's castle, where Drew finds himself trapped without the aid of his beloved friend Flux and locked in prison while being injected by a serum that will turn him into a toon. It's at this point where the difficulty in the puzzles in the game ramp up significantly compared to the previous part. While the puzzles in the first part weren't too difficult, Nefarious's castle acts quite nefariously as you might imagine. The game features a lot more puzzles that seem to pile up one after the other. However, despite the difficulties, I also need to admit, the game doesn't particularly drift from the logic where I feel it's unfair. While I did have to consult the hint website a lot more at this part of the game, a lot of the solutions to the puzzle weren't particularly absurd or unfair. They made sense. Much like how the henchman acted as hindrances to Drew in Act 1, Act 2 features its fair share of dangers. After escaping from the cell by triggering the guards' allergies, Drew can find himself locked away again either by nearby guards posted, or by running afoul of misfortune's hypnosis. <laughs> So, Mr. Blank, care to dance? Two to the one, to the one, to the three. I like good pussy and I like good trees. Smoke so much weed you wouldn't believe. And I get more ass than a toilet seat. Three to the one, to the one, to the three. I met a bad bitch last night in the D. Let me tell you how I want to leave with me. Each time, the guard grows wise to Drew's attempt and, in hilarious fashion, starts taking new measures to prevent himself being tripped, such as using a gas mask and then a vacuum cleaner to clean up all the dust. However, this doesn't prevent Drew from escaping and, after several attempts, the guard announces he's quit, and that Drew can just get a key from underneath the doormat. The only area I found trifling and I would consider as perhaps my only criticism for the design of the puzzles in this game is that the second act features Drew looking for crystals to power up the Count's workshop area. Drew needs to power this up to access a warp device and to escape in the Malevolator. However, the inclusion of the crystals feels like awkward pacing. There are four crystals to be found and each of them are in baffling areas such as under a doormat or in the hands of a prisoner because a henchman just so happened to drop them. This isn't particularly an issue for these two as they are simple enough to gather, but it does cause an issue with the latter two. For whatever reason, they are locked inside gargoyle heads, the one on the left being unlocked and easy to access, whereas the one on the right is locked. In order to unlock the one on the right, Drew needs to press the horn down, which unlocks the one on the right, but rather than allow him to walk across to get it, instead locks if he tries to walk by. At first I thought this was a weird time issue, until I looked up and found that it's based on Drew walking across the room, and he instead needs to take a long way around for, well, whatever reason. 
after managing to make their way through the castle, Drew takes control of a warp device and the Malevolator and uses it to attack Nefarious and King Yu, and collides with Flux, sending the duo falling through the air. Before he hits the ground, Drew says goodbye to his friend, Flux. No! Wait! Take this! It's a trans-dimensional communication device! You know, so we can keep in touch! Do you just carry that around with you? Drew awakens on his desk, convinced that it was all a dream, and decides to promote Flux for the show, only for his boss to berate him and to tell him to do it again. Blank! I've been patient with your little lapses, but this, this is inexcusable! Are you single-handedly trying to destroy everything Fluffy has built for us over the last 10 years? Well, are you? No, 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 no. <laughs> then I suggest you do what I told you to do. Produce the biggest bushy-tailed batch of cute, cuddly bunnies ever rendered by first thing tomorrow morning. Or else, you'll find that it will be you who gets the kick of the old wazoo. Yes. Thank you, sir. Dejected, Drew returns back to start designing new rabbits, but he finds this device for Flux, who contacts him to let him know that King Yu and Nefarious are still alive, and that Drew needs to help, who proceeds to turn into a cartoon and disappear. In the game, I'm heavily suggesting a sequel. And Fluffy, they're still alive! You gotta help us! I'll do it! But wait, 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 how will I get there? Thanks to Nefarious' mutagen ink, that's not going to be a problem. It isn't? <laughs> Whoa! But that sequel would never come to light. As beloved as the game was, Virgin Interactive Entertainment found that the game was a financial failure, having been developed on a budget of $8 million. As a result of this, most of the content was axed from the game, and the game was instead to be split into two, which is why the game ends on a cliffhanger. However, due to the financial constraints from the first game, Virgin Interactive Entertainment pulled the plug on Toonstruck's sequel. While we haven't yet seen any mention of a sequel, a lot of the content relating to the sequel and some of the removed content from the original game can actually be found on Laura J's YouTube, who was involved in the visual effects of the game. This looks to be the best way to fill in the pieces of Drew Blank and Flux Wildly, as it has now been nearly 25 years since the game's release, and as the years pass by, it seems more and more unlikely we will see any conclusion anytime soon. Want to make sure you don't miss out on the next video when it's released? Then make sure you don't forget to subscribe to Noir Reservoir and click that little bell down there to be kept up to date on all future Noir Reservoir videos. Content is typically released as frequently as possible, but I always appreciate likes and comments too, and if you can share the video, I'll absolutely love you if I've ever. So until next time my friends, I'll catch you later. Bye bye.